Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we are discussing helping veterans and others successfully enter the workforce and retain employment with Arthur Langer, Chairman and Founder of Workforce Opportunity Services. And a reminder to Zoom attendees, we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you all for joining us. And Arthur, thank you for coming to us from your offices there. I know you are socially distant. Uh, you, you said that you're the only person in the, in the space. I guess it's a sign of the times. Yes, it's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, it's the sign of the times, but uh, there's still time to come into the office. There's still a huge reservoir of untapped talent here in the United States, and, and human beings are our resource. It's, it's our most valuable resource. So could you talk about how you saw a problem that needed to be addressed in the friction within this market, a friction of competence, with need, a friction of, of knowledge, with the, with, uh, the ability uh, to, to actually provide a useful service that people will pay for? How did you approach solving this, this problem? Yeah, so I, I think there's two fundamental beginnings of this. One of them is I'm a product of it. It's always an interesting thing. I was born in the Bronx. Uh, my, uh, I'm the only one in my family that went to college. I had to do it in a non-traditional way. Uh, my dad was a teamster during the Jimmy Hoffa era. Uh, never got past the eighth grade. That didn't mean he wasn't an intelligent uh, guy. And uh, I actually got discovered. I had artistic talent in junior high school. And I went to a junior high school. I'm not ashamed to tell you it was a war zone in the Bronx and uh, near Fordham Road. Uh, but this teacher somehow had a, a sense and there was a, uh, another teacher that was giving art lessons in a furniture store on Fordham Road in the Bronx and was doing it out of the kindness of his heart. I was there and he pulled me over after a couple of sessions and he said, Art, do you know that you have a lot of talent? And I said, well, thank you very much. He said, are you gonna try out for the famous high school of music and art? And I looked at him and said, what's that? I, I had no idea. And, he prompted me, gave me assignments, and uh, made sure that I applied to the high school music and art and had a portfolio. And I, I made music and art and, and went there and it changed my life. So one person can change your life. And then the, the, the second one is I am a professor at Columbia University. Just think about that. A bum like me gets to Columbia University only in America, right? <laughs> and and uh, I had an African-American student, very gifted, who came to me and said, I'm doing some, I'm trying to help these people in the Drew projects on 135th Street. You see, I'm being specific, so you know I'm telling you the truth, right? And none of these people, they're learning break, fix, and oh my, none of them going to get jobs. How about we do something at Columbia? And we jumped on that, and for five years, we did outstanding research, and I um, got a lot of these individuals jobs and I wrote a, 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 you know, a very good paper that got published, a referee journal, and gave those results to the American Association of um, Colleges and Universities in DC. And I said, here's the problem. One, there is talent out there. There are art langers out there all over the place, but the way we're doing it is not, and here's the word I learned from somebody in Harlem. He said, is your, can you make programs systemic? And that's the key. Because, you know, being nice is nice once, twice, maybe even three times. But nice is not systemic. So the, the, the thing that I find so interesting is that you have this personal experience, you have this personal heart level experience that comes from your childhood, uh, growing up, the kind gestures of people who can help. You then take your life and you evolve your life to the point where you are approached by somebody and in that person you see in that person and the problems that they're trying to solve yourself as well as the teacher who helped you uh, you then collaborate with people who know things that you don't know right. who have awareness that you don't have right. who have connections that you don't have and together you create something and then you transform that into data that can influence the actions of others that whole arc 
is really interesting. Is, it, is this the kind of repeatable art that you've seen in your own career and, and as you shape the organization? You know, absolutely. And, and, and one of the things pre-COVID-19 was there was a skill shortage in this country. I mean, forget about all the outsourcing and everything. There's a skill shortage. And you think that it's not going to exist when we come out of it. All right. And what I said to everybody is, you know, the talent's there. You just got to go find it. And what we came up with is, you know, my motto always in a nonprofit or any business is, do you really want to do what I do? And you know what? You don't want to do what I do. Uh, we're in the streets. We're, we're, we're in high schools. We talk to parents. Uh, we go on military bases. Uh, I mean, we're in the trenches. And, and the reason it's worked is because it's complementary. Uh, and, it, and, and, it, and I wanted to do something, even as a nonprofit, that obeyed the laws of supply and demand. And if I could show, not being nice, nice is good. I like people that are nice. But I would rather them say, I want another WOS person because it's worked, because this is a great deal. And that's when you get a systemic solution going. Uh, uh, you know, nice is good, but it doesn't change what's going on. And that's what I wanted to do. How could we scale this? There's, really a, there's a way of describing uh, uh, workforce, employers, which is kind of pejorative, right? There, there's the makers and takers kind of a kind of a division, which which has always I find it always to be personally offensive. Um, in in a recession, we are entering into a very very deep economically troubled time. Um, we have got people who need jobs who aren't able to work for the pandemic now, but with the economic um, crisis that is facing us it's likely to extend. How does that affect what you do so that people are empowered to develop their own ways of earning living? Uh, a living? How, does, how does your work, because if you're not shaping it for something that is already prefabbed by a, you know, an employer needing uh, uh, people, how do you help people navigate that aspect? I think there's two pieces. One is, again, getting back to the supply demand concept, follow your market. All right, follow the consumer, follow the business. So you're training people in a way to think, right? In a way to think about and problem solve through their own careers. It's not just skills right. in the sense of I can do that, I can, I can weld, I can computer program, I can do whatever, right? It's also a way to analyze. So that basically takes a cue of, of your own career and how you look at data and how you respond to it, right? Right, I mean, let me put it through another way. Um, and, and I don't, I, you know, training is easy to me. Identified cognitive skills in any person doesn't take very long. And what we've done in this country is we keep throwing training as the solution. Let's train a thousand people. Let's train 500 people. And what we're missing is, for lack of a better word, the soft skills realities of the world, right? right? Uh, or uh, the fancier word is professional development. Military veterans don't lack intelligence. What they lack is people don't realize how foreign a corporation is to a military veteran or right. a kid that's coming from the Bronx like me or a kid that may have to even lie a little bit just to survive and understanding what that is to somebody who walks into a major corporation and, and has never seen anything like this. So what we do is, you know, the old thing that... that um, that was said is, you know, no wine before it's time. Orson Welles once said that on a commercial. And here's what the mistake is. You know, we, we train 500 people. We give, we give all this money to these companies. And, and look, I'm not criticizing them. And they train them and they drop off the bus and they send these kids in and they just get, they get torched. You know, a couple of them make it because they figure it out for themselves. What we do is we hire them. I don't, you know, cut, one of the things that came out of the five-year study was that corporations don't really know how to do this. Right. It's hard to do it. They're lean and mean. And, and, and so we educate these companies along with these individuals on how to assimilate this talent. But here's what we've learned. We have 90% retention after they're hired away. We prepare them just like wine, right? 
when they're ready, they then get hired away for free. Well, and I think that your, your point about expertise um, is, is really uh, interesting um, and intelligence, right? If you're just skimming along the top and you're only taking the part of the workforce that already has the acculturated elements to their behaviors, then you're very likely to have a lot of confirmation bias, uh, racial inequities uh, are likely to be perpetuated. Uh, people who come from the Bronx are likely not because of a lack of intelligence or capability. Uh, if they grew up in modest means, they're likely to never get uh, the ability to exercise their full potential and their full skills simply because of the barriers to entry of things like culture. Uh, we just asked a, a, uh, a question here, um, the assessment of the biggest problems faced by job providers. And the two uh, answers that got the most uh, response was a lack of education or skills required for certain jobs. So lack of skills or education or lack of information on available employers. But you're saying that there's an actual third element, which is the whole behavioral uh, aspect, the whole underpinnings that really support a found provide the foundation for skills to be exercised, right? Absolutely. Um, uh, again, I think that assessing cognitive ability and training somebody to do something, we've never had a problem with that. The real issue uh, that, that workers and companies will talk about is they just don't know how to behave uh, within the culture. And the culture doesn't know how to assimilate that talent because they're not given the means to an education to do that. So to just say, let's be diverse, let's have diversity, that's one thing. Uh, but to be diverse, to be a diverse company is a whole other challenge. Right. And what we've seen recently by the Black Lives Matter, I mean, we've been doing this for 18 years now. So we were way ahead of the curve, is it, what they were doing wasn't working. It's sort of like, you're not listening to me. You don't understand really what the problem is. Right. And, and we've seen that early on. And you're not seeing the magnificent benefits of people who have complex family structures who go into these companies and don't leave. They stay. They're involved with the community. They bring experience that represent your consumers. You know, Porter, the famous economics professor from Harvard, said it clearly. Companies that succeed must have representation from their local communities, right. and, but they don't know how to reach out and find it. Because and they don't want to change very often in order to create the, the company. You know, it's sort of like the change without changing uh, dilemma. Right? Yeah. And, lo and look what happens to companies today with digital disruption. All right. The companies that don't evolve go away. So you see here that the diversity factor is not just about being nice or ticking off things. The reality of diversity is the value that it brings to your company, what it means to be diverse in a global economy. And who's not in a global economy today? And incidentally, this is not just a US problem. I'm working with colleagues all over the world, all right, who are dealing in Europe with this issue. Everywhere, uh, people are confronting these challenging in a global environment. So could you just uh, give us a sense of the scale of your operation, how many people are trained, how you actually deliver this, how you're funded? Uh, because the thing that's fascinating here is that given all the resource that, that you've been referring to in, in uh, corporations, um, and the fact that these programs have not really been terribly successful. Um, you are a David, a, you know, with, in comparison to a Goliath. How does it work for you at WAS? Well, the first thing is you listen to your, the need. Where is the problem? Right. So unlike a lot of other nonprofits who open up in a location, and then they train a bunch of people through a grant. I mean, we're a 501c3, but I like to think of us as social entrepreneurs. Uh, they produce a product and they hope there's a buyer there. What we do is we go to a company and say, where's your problems? Where are your needs? And we offer them uh, a Burger King approach. You know, have it your way. What is it that you want? We're not gonna violate our model. 
So one company may say to us, like a Prudential, hey, we need 20 people that have these skill sets and we want specialized training. We want you to find that talent. We want these locations. And that's what we do. So, you know, with Prudential, we're in El Paso, Texas with military veterans, which I stimulated because I happen to know the president of University of Texas El Paso, which was a marvelous concept for them. Uh, or um, they'll say, you know what, we want, it, we want three people to try it out, okay. Or, you know what, we're thinking of outsourcing. Do you do outsourcing? Well, we have 20 people, veterans, in Dallas, Texas, for a company called Parsons out of, out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, being managed by a senior retired veteran officer, mm -hmm. and they can hire them away as they need it, but we're actually, that's what they wanted. So can you meet the needs of this person? But here's the other thing we do. We pay 100% healthcare coverage, 100%, all right? Blue Cross Blue Shield. We pay for school at night. We have funds to take care of people that have minor things like, I don't have enough money to get on a train or I can't even get in a car in Dallas because there are no trains in Dallas, right? So we pick them up with Uber cars. We take care of everything, but we basically allow the buyer to establish what it is they want. And if you can't do that, then you really can't scale. So it's market responsive. Right. You're right. listening to your market and you're responding. We start with a yes. Right. Instead of trying to uh, get your market to fit into your model, you start with a yes. Um, you are taking away a lot of the risk and you're being adaptable in terms of, of how things, how money flows and how work flows uh, back and forth. Yet you're providing a sufficient structure to um, uh, settle both the the prospective employees and the uh, the the employers so that they have confidence in working with you and we give them a myriad of ways of finding where the money is mm -hmm. you know uh, nonprofits are used to going after foundations and we'll do that we can raise money but sometimes there are service revenues that we can take in because we have an IT organization that has uh, has a budget that's sitting somewhere uh, so I think that's a, a, a very, very important part of how we operate in that we're going to bring value, we're going to bring the value that you're looking for, and we're going to do it in a way that you can scale it over a period of time. And the other thing you get from listening to your customers, now look at this one. We started off doing a lot of IT stuff because that's where the outsourcing was. United Rentals comes to us five years ago, six years ago, and says, we're looking for veteran mechanics, all right? And what we want you to do is find that talent, relocate it, handle the vocational training to become a mechanic, and then after 20 weeks, we're gonna take them and relocate them around the United States, and we're gonna give them a future and a life. Last year, before COVID, we did 100 veteran mechanics for United Rentals. So the model works in skills as well, right? It's not all about just the, the, the white collar works. There is a shortage of skills. And, and the Netherlands came to us in the north of the Netherlands where they have a skill shortage and they love the United Rental Models and the science works across the board. So we're, you know, it's almost like a little bit of an Amazon model. You keep following you know, the joke about Amazon is what, what business are they in? And the answer is whatever they want. So we didn't start out to be blue collar, but we're doing that also. We just completed another poll where we, where we asked people what the biggest problems are faced by, by job seekers. And we had the, the lack of education and skills. So there's, there's a lot of um, intersection with what employers are saying. But uh, also that, that comp and benefits that are on offer are too low. And we have a problem here with working poor in the United States. Um, how do you deal with the question of uh, helping people to improve their skill sets or improve their prospects in terms of higher paying uh, roles uh, that allow them to emerge not only into the workforce, but, but um, exit the ranks of the working poor? 
Yeah, I think uh, the first part of it is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Carnegie, of all people, uh, uh, made a phrase that I never forgot when I was doing my doctoral work. And he said, ladders of ascent. Right. Education has to be ladders of ascent. You have to keep going. All right. And, and the jobs that we place have ladders of ascent. I'm not, a, I'm not looking to place people uh, into a job that's a dead end job. Now, the science, as a professor hat now, mm -hmm. uh, years and years of this data and, and three or four published referee journal articles now, what do you think the most important thing is for someone to be successful, assuming they have the, the cognitive ability? I mean, you can measure that. Learning new skills. Yeah, and, and self-esteem. Really? The minute that person believes that they can do this, man, we have proof that the more cognitively advanced people we work with with lower self-esteem do not outperform the people with higher self-esteem with slightly lower cognitive skills. And that connects to resilience, right? It, 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 it's basically the wherewithal to, to struggle past uh, impediments. And that's why we partner in many of these situations with universities, Rutgers, Michigan, uh, Georgia Tech, because if I get that person on the campus of a major university, which they never thought, like Art Langer, never thought I, that that could ever happen. And you start seeing people that look like you, and the minute where you can say, I can do that, mm -hmm. I belong. If you, if you talk to people who are poor or from uh, underserved or underrepresented minorities, and you ask them why they made it, I'll guarantee you that somewhere along the line, they believe that they belong and could make it. So we focus on building that skill, and we can measure it now. And, and, and to say, okay, this person's very smart, but what do we have to do to bring them up? And then the other thing is we're 24 by seven. Look, I'll give you stories. I, would you believe a story that I had a young woman, African-American that graduates from technology high school in Newark, right? She's gonna learn cyber at Prudential. She's going to Rutgers at night on a special program that we designed. And we figure, find out that she's not showing up to Rutgers at night. She's working at Pru. She's doing fine under us. So we call her. And you know what she tells me? She says, I can't make it to class because I don't have a dad and my mom has to work at night and I have to babysit for my younger brother. And we say, well, you got to talk to her about this. This is a great opportunity for you. And she says, you know what? Why don't you talk to her? And you know what? We did. And you know what I did? We paid for a babysitter. Now, let's say we're not there. What do you think happens? It doesn't work. Now, this young woman is working now for Prudential full time, and she wrote me a lovely letter. Or a veteran that's, how about a veteran sleeping in a car because he has no parents and his guardian passed away and nobody knew. That day, I wrote a check for $2,500 to get that individual into an apartment. Now, who's going to do that? Is Rutgers going to do They can't do that. Is, is, is Prudential or any of these major, they can't do it. So we're doing, we're complementing it. And the, the, what I would leave you with on this thing, this question, is that do you have a win-win? So here's my win-win for you. If I'm giving someone health care coverage, isn't that a win? If I'm paying them a salary, isn't that a win? I'm paying payroll taxes, isn't that a win? All right? If I'm paying for their college education, isn't that a win? Where does that money go? It goes back into the... the what is the corporation doing? They're getting a great deal and they're getting diversity. What is your annual budget? Last year, um, uh, we did uh, a little bit over $15 million. And 94% went back to the individuals in healthcare, in education, and salary. And, and the other thing I tell you is I hope at Christmas time, my kids, as I call them, will say, I bought Christmas presents. <laughs> and you know what you call that? Consumer economy. spending. <laughs> right, an economy. So everybody um, wins. So when you, when you look at your, your funding streams, there's a big, huge chunk that is earned income, right? And, and then you have some contributed income. What is the balance between those two? About 50-50. Uh -huh. 
And, you know, we're similar. I learned, as I told you before we went on, I did a lot of work for PBS. And when you give PBS uh, a donation of money and they give you a disc, that's a service revenue. So we, we take that in as service revenues. And, uh, and we, we, are, we spend it that way. And so 50% uh, of it is donations of various kinds. But it is those other revenues that create the scalability. Because what's music to my ears is when a company, a manager in a company said, can we get another WAS resource? Some people call us WOS, some people call us WAS, mm -hmm. all right? That's when you get systemic, all right? You need the support from the top. But when you get line managers saying, I want another one of these resources, they're great. So you invented the gig economy before there was a gig economy. Listen, we've been doing military spouses working from home for years, for years. So, uh, you know, I feel good about that. What upsets me is when I watch TV and everyone says, we're going to train all these people. And you know it as well as I do that some companies throw money at this. Right. All right. That's never going to get you to really value the talent. And trust me, I, I like to call it hidden talent as opposed to untapped talent. And then, you know, bums like me maybe can really contribute to in, in interesting stuff, right? Yeah. Who would have thought? In terms of this next phase in our economy, um, is entrepreneurship, the, the idea of founding your own business and, and taking off in that way, uh, part of what you're trying to uh, help certain individuals with those interests to do? Absolutely. You know, we're, you know, certainly the universities like ours at Columbia, have now realized, as you see the, um, uh, the delivery uh, part of the businesses go from the west to the east, and now it's going from the east to the south, where you're having third world countries that are delivering uh, various types of services for lower, lower cost, and then the automation factors, all right? So how do we create more Apples and Amazons and how do we support people to do that? And honestly, universities has never really done with that well. Right. So uh, what, what we're doing a lot is, is thinking about investing in underserved where we'll take board seats, uh, not to make money, mm -hmm. but to guide them and then just let them go. Um, you know, there's, it's the old mentor rule, you know, where, uh, I, I've started this company. I had started some other companies in my life. I had failed at starting a company. And there's no better lesson than, than failing. You know, you, as we say, you get the eye of the tiger like Rocky, you know. <laughs> and and uh, we're there to, to, to spurt that, identify it. And there is no better world. Look, the guy that helped me at, at, at uh, the furniture store, you know what his, nest, his name was? Mr. What? Ness. You know, I'll never forget that name, ever. Mm -hmm. And I never said thank you to him. But you know what? I didn't have to. Because that's not why he was doing it. So uh, just, just to close off, you know, I, we took another poll asking people where the, where the best uh, place would be for fruitful, long-lasting uh, careers. And we listed uh, finance, health, hospitality, manufacturing, real estate, retail, all these different sectors. The, the, the three sectors that got votes were technology, mental health, and physical health, and then finance and banking. How do you see the market for uh, developing here in the United States for the kind of people who you are trying to support? So here's the way I would say it to you. We're going from a vertical concept of thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing my digital disruption hat now. Right to a horizontal model, which is what Amazon did, all right? So here's what I would say to you. Charlemagne was wrong. All roads don't lead to Rome, they lead to technology, all right? So all businesses will become platforms of technologies, of data, massive amounts of data. And what you're gonna see is that, what happened with Goldman Sachs. Is Goldman Sachs a financial institution? I thought so, but Goldfine said, we're a technology company and one third of our people. So what I would say to people is digital skills are the key. And don't worry so much about the industry. 
worry about those skill sets because all of these companies, all the roads are leading to technology. Healthcare is all about technology. Universities now are now getting a lesson on what virtual learning is all about to bring down those costs, right? Finance, as you say. Finance you know, is that, 90% technology, all right? Manufacturing is about manufacturing technology. Manufacturing is all technology. So what's happening is in an evolutionary, it's like an industrial revolution. The difference is it's happening much quicker. So I run around the world, literally around the world, all right, and talk to organizations who are struggling with this transformation. But the opportunity, worry about the skills. If you're capable of understanding how to work in a digital world, you're not, it, the industry isn't gonna matter, all right? Because they're gonna want you. Well, Art Langer, thank you so much for sharing the work of, of this wonderful organization, WAS, the uh, Workforce Opportunity Services. It's just such a great story that comes from your heart and your own background and, and taking your, your personal experience and creating so much value out in the market and, and helping people um, who, with a little bit of assistance, uh, can run the world is, is just a wonderful, wonderful contribution. Yeah, thank you. And, and just remember this, I say it to my students all the time because it was said to me, you know what no means? It means no now. But not it may yet. not be no 10 minutes from now. So, <laughs> so just keep driving. Those people in these nonprofit and other organizations, believe in yourself and, and, and just expect no. <laughs> but no can become yes. Be persistent. No not yet, right? Be, that's right. Be passionate, expect it, enjoy it, and keep going. And you'd be surprised that... Uh, uh, a poor kid in the Bronx, three blocks from Yankee Stadium, can become a, a professor at Columbia University. Who would have thought, right? And uh, that's what I try to instill in all of these young people that I'm working with and ensure that they know that they're doing it. I consider myself an offensive tackle. You know what an offensive tackle does? They block and make holes for you to go through. And that's what Mr. Ness did for me. He didn't do the work, I did the work. He opened up the hole, the path so that I could go through it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for your work. That's the nonprofit report attendees. Thank you for coming and your responses to the polls. And we'll see you next Tuesday.